I do a, a scrolling presentation through this. Um, then feel free to interrupt at any point. Just yell out any questions as they come. Um, so I've made WireGuard, which is a uh, replacement for OpenVPN and IPsec. Um, that's uh, a lot more simple than either of them. Um, IPsec has all sorts of problems with its complexity and uh, all sorts of layering. It's, it's very academically correct, um, but in practice it's impossible to use. And uh, uh, time after time I see networks that are, are completely ownable by faulty IPsec configurations. Uh, and a lot of people like to use OpenVPN and similar things uh, as a replacement, but it's slow. It's in user space. Um, it's, it's based on, uh, on TLS, and no one really wants a TLS stack for something that they want to be really secure. Um, so WireGuard tries to strip away all of this cruft and come up with something really simple and minimal uh, that we can actually use to secure networks. Um, the, uh, the, the basic authentication model uh, is like SSH. Um, two parties exchange their public keys through some out-of-band process and afterwards they're able to talk to each other. Um, and it's designed like this so that this out-of-band key exchange can, uh, can, can be done on any level. Uh, corporations can use their X509 or LDAP stuff on top of it. Um, ordinary people can exchange it in the same ways, say OTR, that they've been transferring SSH keys for a long time. Um, and, and so that's all left kind of out of, out of the scope of WireGuard. Um, and also it's layer three only. Um, I think for joining two networks, uh, unless you're in some very special case scenario, such as the, the Gandhi presentation we saw yesterday, um, layer three is really what makes sense, especially from a performance point of view. Um, so as I said, it lives in the kernel um, and it's all configurable with this, uh, with this very simple tool called WG, um, uh, which at some point should be folded into the normal IP tool uh, that we all use for, for managing our networks. Um, and, and, and generally, uh, WireGuard is, is kind of blasphemous. We, as we'll see here, we break a lot of layers. Um, we break a lot of uh, 90s assumptions about how, uh, how the different layers of networks and overlay networks and tunnels should be held. Uh, we break a lot of assumptions on what should be in user space and what should be in kernel space. And some of what WireGuard does is wrong. Uh, from a formal point of view, it's, it's uh, it's not pretty, but the result that comes out of it is something uh, that is simple um, and that does actually work in a minimal way that you don't need hundreds of thousands of lines of code to implement. It just works, it can be audited, etc. cetera. Um, so uh, by comparison, IPsec um, works with, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm leading this, obviously, uh, but these two fellows here in the audience have been working on it with me, and uh, I've now started to work with a uh, professor at Columbia to try and get some of the academic parts verified, and et cetera. So small but, but growing. Um, so just uh, for, for comparison, IPsec um, uses the kernel's... Uh, um, uh, transform infrastructure. Uh, you have packets going out and you have an additional layer in the kernel that, uh, that changes these packets in some way. Um, and it, it's, it's very modular, extensible. Uh, it can do compression in addition to various modes of encryption. Um, and uh, its choices on whether or not to encrypt packets are managed by a user space daemon. Um, like uh, from raccoon or strong swan or a whole variety of various daemons. Um, 
that then do a key exchange. Uh, the popular one is called IKE, um, which uh, again is extremely extensible, supports everything, and has an enormous attack surface. Um, also, IPsec is uh, is doing encryption where it's supposed to be done. It just encrypts uh, the IP packet, and it doesn't worry about tunnels or anything else. Um, so with IPsec, you would put a tunnel or something like that over it. And this is great and correct, but it's hard and uh, um, leads to all sorts of uh, um, not only programming errors, but deployment errors um, when you try to use it. Uh, so WireGuard uh, resembles a little bit more of the, uh, the OpenVPN model or the model used with uh, many uh, ton device uh, drivers. Um, and you see we, we call IP link add dev WG0 type WireGuard. And this is just the typical IP tool from, from Linux. Uh, is anyone not familiar with this tool? Okay, good. Um, so we, we call this and now we have the WG0 device. Um, and then we can use IP address to add an IP address to it. Um, and then we just have WG0 and it shows up in ifconfig or, or any of the IP tools. Um, and, and from that point forward, if we want something to be encrypted, we, certainly, we, we, we simply have it routed to be going out through that device. So we can use the ordinary kernel routing table. Um, we can use IP tables rules where we say, uh, is it from WG0? Okay, accept, otherwise drop. Um, and all, all the nice things that network administrators are used to using. Um, we don't have to worry about security marks or uh, uh, the, the nitty gritty of the transform or IPsec infrastructure. We can just say, is it from this interface? Or is it from an IP address that must be from this interface? Um, so uh, this also allows things like uh, uh, the TCP wrappers and host.allow or .deny, or uh, you can even have a service uh, bind to a, a address that only WG0 uses, and then you can be uh, assured that the connections to that service are encrypted. Um, so th just this alone simplifies a, a whole series of headaches. Yeah. Uh, no, we, we don't do fragmentation. Um, I, I suppose that could be added if someone comes up with a, a good use case for it. But um, uh, it, it, in my opinion, at least now, the, the fragmentation question is best um, either for the IP stack itself to reassemble packets as it does or for, uh, for the upper layers like TCP to handle that. But uh, sure, I, there, there might be use cases. Um, okay, so as we've mentioned, all, all the all the usual friendly utilities are are available with it. Um, okay, so so how does this work? Um, again, with the with the VPN idea, I've tried to to strip away all the things we're used to with VPNs, and just boil it down to what's what's the fundamental? What what is a VPN really? What's it doing? And the way WireGuard answers this is we associate uh, the public key of a peer, which is the identity of a peer, the identity of uh, someone we're talking to securely, with the IP addresses it's allowed to use. And that's it. Um, so uh, we, we call this a crypto key routing table, give it a nice fancy name. Um, so a server, for example, uh, a VPN access point server, you might call it, um, would have a configuration that could look like this. We have a peer with this public key you see, X, T, I, B, A, blah, blah. And that peer is allowed to use those allowed IPs. Uh, the next peer, those allowed IPs, et cetera. Um, so when a packet comes in, um, the, the, the kernel will decrypt the packet, um, authenticate it, 
And uh, after it's done that, it knows who it's come from. And then it can ask, okay, has this packet uh, been sent from an IP address that is allowed for this peer? Um, in other words, it looks at the source IP of the decrypted packet and says, is this one of the allowed IPs? Um, inversely, on the way out, when a packet's sent and it hits the interface, it hits WG0, uh, it says, okay, what's, what's the, uh, the destination? Of uh, this packet, and it says, "Oh, let's say it's uh, 10, 192, uh, 122, 4. Okay, well that would be that second peer there, and it'll then encrypt it uh, and add an authentication tag using uh, that key. Um, Does the be managed by is what? Does the IPs might be have been handled by the key server? Be handled by NetFilter. Well, so the NetFilter's role in this would be um, the packet comes in, uh, it hits the the kernel driver, and before the packet even bubbles up to the upper layers like NetFilter, it's validated. So is it has this uh, IP packet for this address been sent from the right person? Then NetFilter can do things like uh, I'll only allow this IP address to access SSH. And it doesn't need to care about any of the encryption parts because there's a guaranteed mapping between the IP address and the authenticity of the sender. Does that answer the question? Okay, so this, this here is, is really key. I just wonder, is there anyone that, for whom this is a little bit fuzzy or? Ah, right. So I'll get to that next. That's a great question. So this would be a server where, um, <coughs> say, people are connecting up from their laptops at conferences. Yep. Yeah. Um, that's 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 fine. It still receives a packet from. Ah, well, in this case, the whole IP packet is encapsulated. So if it's being sent over NAT, um, uh, so in this case, the, the IP header that's encrypted on the inside of the packet um, will still be an address that's a part of the tunnel. So the fact that it's, it's maybe tr going over NAT uh, externally doesn't matter at all. It's just operating as an ordinary UDP connection does. Yeah, so I think when I answer his question, yours will also be answered for this. So th this is a server setup where you, you have a <coughs> server and say multiple people at a conference are connecting up to it to get their tunnel or whatever. Uh, a client configuration might look a little more like this. In this case, uh, the peer's public key is the corresponding public key to the server's private key above. Um, it's not visually clear that they're related, but actually if you multiply it on an elliptic curve, et cetera, they are. Um, the allowed IPs for, for the, that peer is everything because uh, say we assume we're in a hostile network and we want to just tunnel all our traffic through it. Uh, so the zero slash zero. And to answer your question, um, in this case we specify the endpoint, which is an internet address with a port. Um, so when the client starts sending packets up to the server, um, the server receives some internet packet, tries to decrypt it, um, uh, maybe is unsuccessful, in which case it's bogus and it's, it's discarded, or it is successful, and then it knows, ah, okay, the current external IP address of this peer 
is this 192, 95, 5, 96. Um, and then this table up here would be updated inside the kernel. Uh, so in the, in the IPsec world, this is known as Road Warrior. Um, in cell phones, it's, it's like uh, roaming between networks, perhaps, would be an analogy. Um, in other words, wh whatever the most recent packet a WireGuard peer has received from someone else that correctly is authenticated uh, will then be the external address that future packets are sent to. So with your question about NAT, in this case, uh, it, it's just receiving a packet from an ordinary internet external IP address. And if that gets changed, that's fine, uh, because this is all external to the encrypted payload. OK. Uh, yep. Yeah, so, so this is all up to user space configuration. So the, the scripts I have uh, do like that old hack where I add 0 slash 1 and 128 slash 1 plus the explicit address. And no. Um, this is a, another interesting layering thing. It could be nice to do this in the kernel for cleanup purposes, but it's not clear that this would be permissible to anybody. You know, it, it would be convenient, but I don't know that it would really be desired to do it in the kernel. Um, yeah, um, but only, uh, only to start up and uh, to tear it down. So um, the normal, uh, you know, IP tools. In this case, I have the WG tool that I showed before, um, which is pretty much the same syntax as IP, and at some point, Hopefully, they'll just be merged together into the same tool. But there's no daemon that needs to be run because, uh, you know, it's just set it up, give the information about the peers of the kernel, and disappear. Say again. Wait, wait, what? You don't have to be into it. VPNC script. The script VPNC packet that that would Ah, so you've already written this and then I can just. Um, no, no, I don't want to. Why can I do that? Oh, okay. I don't want to it. I stole VPNC. Ah, okay. So use VPNC. Perfect, thank you. Okay. So I was just curious about the, the sticky IP when a packet is accepted, that's going to be filed. Yeah. So does, uh, I guess, Wirebar itself. Yeah, so the, the, re, the replay attack uh, is solved by the cryptographic layers, uh, which I'll get to in a bit. Uh, um, the way the encryption works with uh, key erasure and nonces um, makes it uh, cryptographically impossible to do the replay attack. So I, I don't need to worry about, uh, um, I don't know, uh, token buckets for replay or, or this sort of thing. Okay, so should I move on from here? Is this general concept pretty clear? Okay. Um, okay, so we talked about the roaming road warrior aspect. And uh, although in this example above, I show server and client, um, really this is just one setup. In, in WireGuard world, everything is a peer, uh, which has a public key and the allowed IPs. And... Uh, there's no difference between a client or a server except for how you have this configured. So you don't even have to have a client configure topology. You could do, I don't know, various star or tree things, whatever sort of things networking people like to do. It's possible because it's just simply a peer. Um, okay, so the WG utility um, has nice colorized output if you just run it. Um, it also has... Uh, easily greppable output and you know, all the things you expect from a command line utility in 2015. Um, 
you can, you can set things using the config files above, using setconf and getconf. Or if you like to do things directly from scripts, you can uh, fill out a, a very long command listing each of the peers or issue multiple of these, each with a peer, uh, using the wg set one, uh, the listen port, the private key, the peer with the slat IPs, the endpoint, etc. Um, so, you know, this is the, the sorts of things you read in man pages and uh, hopefully it, it resembles how IP works and syntax and feeling that it should be familiar enough to use <laughs> and, and learn. Um, for generating these public and private keys, uh, a private key in WireGuard is, uh, is just uh, random bytes um, with certain top bytes masked out to fit the elliptic curve that we're using. Um, and uh, so you run gen key to make a private key and then the pub key takes in a private key on standard input and then spits out on standard output the corresponding public key. Um, so it's, uh, it's a computation. Yeah. So you don't need to know what the Correct. Maybe yet and maybe never if that code looks scary and big and hard to audit. But maybe it's really pretty. I haven't read it yet. Um, so yeah, that, that's still up in the air as well. Um, am I right when I think there is no user space data for all of this stuff? It's passed to the central module and it's only going to the uh, Nope, it uses Netlink, uh, or R R RT Netlink uh, specifically. Uh, so you're correct that there's no user space daemon, it's just talking to the kernel, but not through ioctals. Uh, it's using the interfaces that IP uses and the, the, the stuff that all the net filter guys like now. Uh, don't get all the, the uh, private key is read by the kernel. Ah, so the private key is read by user space by the WG tool, uh, read into memory, and then it's put into uh, a, a buffer that has the correct netlink format, and then it's passed uh, to the kernel through uh, the various socket syscalls, because it's uh, Netlink's just a socket type. Okay. Um, yeah. Do you have plans to integrate that with Kong? Yeah, I, I think this this would definitely be on the roadmap. Uh, I, I don't really care for Network Manager. Probably someone else would would do that for me, but. Uh, I consider adding it to systemd network D. I, I don't know. I, I'm not a big systemd guy, but that seems like an interesting modern target to incorporate it. Um, and again, with, with all this stuff internally, it's just really standard Netlink messages. So anyone that's ever written any low-level networking user space tools at all can pretty easily just make the messages pop in the fields and send it off to the kernel. Um, and then for people who like writing scripts and everything else, this WG tool works fine with uh, Bash, as we'll see soon. Um, okay, so as I mentioned before, uh, we're, we're working on the, the SSH model of authorized keys. Uh, so this means both parties have to have each other's static public keys beforehand. Um, which is, which is great for just a small group of friends, but uh, doesn't really scale to big enterprise setups and complicated key distribution schemes. Uh, and, and all the, the enormous variety of this that people have. And, and frankly, I don't really want to care about that stuff either. Uh, too many use cases, too many customers. Um, so in, instead, this is trivially relegated to user space using these WG tools to add and remove peers ad hoc. Um, and so someone could write uh, a TLS server over it or X509 server. So just to test this out, I wrote a so-called enterprise server using the ugliest bash possible uh, that would do some kind of uh, dynamic uh, key distribution with uh, SSL and X509. I mean, this is horrendous, you know, but you could imagine somebody, I don't know, uh, making some Java framework or whatever to support their enterprise beam builder widgets or, you know, whatever people do. Uh, but yeah. 
the, the thing is, this really works, and it's it's been very nice for testing new machines and uh, uh, VMs and things. Um, in, in the repository, I, I have a server.sh and client.sh, and you just run these, and it works magically. So as a debugging aid, this vomit here is quite nice, in fact. Um, OK, so when you send a packet through the WireGuard device, um, it just sends it, and it just works. And it appears to be connectionless. Uh, you, you give the kernel uh, the keys, and uh, say you're running Wireshark and looking at all the packets that are going in and out. After you give the kernel the keys, nothing seems to happen. And then you send a packet, and the, the packet sends, or your ping works. And it seems like it's connectionless. Uh, but in fact, you, you can't really have a connectionless or a stateless protocol uh, that's secure these days. Um, uh, the first obvious reason would be a replay attack. If it's stateless, then it means it has to have the same response to every stimulus, and therefore replay attacks are possible. Uh, so I mean, you, like this is true by the most basic theoretical foundations of what it means to be stateless. So in fact, it, it, it is a stateful protocol, but it appears connectionless, and it operates connectionless. Uh, and for this, there's some, some magic happening. Uh, so let's go into that. Um, uh, when data packets are sent, they're encrypted using uh, symmetric cryptography. So uh, both peers have uh, an agreed shared secret that they use. Um, but in order to come to a shared secret, they have to have a handshake uh, or a key exchange. And we accomplish this in two messages. One, the initiator to the responder. And then in the next, the responder replies with some other stuff, responder to initiator. And after that, they've exchanged enough material uh, that they're able to compute the same shared secret securely. And they can begin uh, sending packets to each other. Um, out, of, out of these messages, we get all the, the latest and greatest of uh, the protocol uh, security that folks seem to want these days. Um, identity hiding uh, introduced with uh, the Sigma protocol. Perfect forward secrecy, uh, which um, we're now finally beginning to see in, in TLS being used, uh, but for a long time it wasn't. Uh, replay attack prevention, as uh, acquired before. Um, and we protect it against uh, key compromise and personation. It seems like every every couple months, someone on uh, Hacker News or Reddit comes out with their own variant of a Diffie-Hellman-based key exchange. And they're all vulnerable to key compromise and personation, which means if you're able to compromise the key of, uh, of a server, then anyone can uh, spoof packets to that server that's been compromised. And so even in the face of such a compromise, uh, we don't allow impersonation. Uh, we also have perfect forward secrecy, which means if, uh, if your box is popped and your static keys are stolen, um, the, uh, the NSA or whomever can't retroactively decrypt all the information that's been sent. Um, some people argue a, a better name for this would be key erasure, which just means you have an ephemeral temporary key that's actually being used and is erased from memory every once in a while. Um, okay, so how does, how does this appear connectionless? Um, well, there still is state. Um, essentially what we do is if we don't get, uh, if we don't get a message back uh, during the during the key exchange, uh, we just try again. So that, that's that's normal. Um, but then the clever thing we do is, um, if we've received data from somebody, but we don't have any data to send, after say ten seconds, we'll send a keep alive. But only in that case. So in other words, we're not sending keep alives all the time, like in a, a bunch of terrible chatty protocols. We're only sending a keep alive if we don't have anything to send, but we've received data. Um, and that way, someone on the other end can say, 
oh, I've been sending data, but I haven't gotten anything back, not even a keep alive. So I should probably reinitiate the handshake. Um, so in this way, we always know when we should do a handshake, um, but we're not exchanging data uh, gratuitously. Uh, okay, a any questions about this? Or was this clear? Yeah. Okay. Um, in, the, in similar thought with, with timers, we, uh, we get rid of all of, uh, ephemeral private key material um, after a certain timeout period. Um, we, uh, we make sure we don't send too many messages using the same key. Uh, we won't send a message using a key that's really old. Um, so just all, all these things so that the key we're using for encryption is actually ephemeral, is actually going to be disappearing at some point. Um, okay, and he, he, here's, here's an interesting kind of kernel tie-in. The handshake to a given peer doesn't occur until you actually have data to send to a peer. Um, so this way, if you remember our, our server setup, where we have a peer with the allowed IPs, but we could have hundreds of peers, and we configure that. We don't want the server initiating a handshake to a, a billion people at once. Instead, a handshake will only happen um, when, there's, when there's a packet to send. Uh, and the way we deal with this is by you're using or abusing, depending on how much you know about this or care about subqueuing or your opinions on how it should be used, uh, the, the net device subqueue system. Um, in kernel network uh, drivers, um, you have a function to send a packet. Um, and what happens is user space queues up packets to be sent, and this function is then called every time something should happen. Um, but you can do things like uh, stop this queue, so that if, uh, if you're sending a bunch of packets and uh, say the hardware can't send it fast enough or uh, software doesn't know what to do with it, you can just stop the queue and we'll just pile up until you do know something to do with, with it. Um, and so if we don't yet have a handshake completed with a peer, we wouldn't want to stop the queue for everybody. So instead we have a separate sub queue for each peer that we talk to. Uh, and, and, and that way we can stop the specific peer sub queue then when a handshake is completed, we restart it and packets flow. Um, so when you, uh, when you start a uh, WireGuard interface and ping somebody, um, that ping message is actually queued up until it does this uh, one round trip handshake and then it goes off. But to user space doesn't see the difference at all. Um, and uh, you can change the queue size to be arbitrarily uh, big or small, depending on what you imagine your latencies to be like, etc. Any questions about this, or, or importantly, objections? For, you, you know a lot about that device work. Yeah. This one packet is coming through, the server has packets for a client, for which you jump off and pull my bag up there. How long will it hold the queue until? Until the queue is full. Um, actually, that's not totally true. Um, let's see. If it has packets to send you, uh, it'll fill till the queue is full, uh, and then it won't take more. And then it'll try and do a handshake for a while. So they actually address the mic. Right. Right. And uh, um, uh, the way it should work, uh, we're going to have a kind of an exponential back off, like what SMTP does with retrying. Um, but we have a, a certain uh, try window for it, and after it tries a bunch, then it drops it. Um, and I think right now we, uh, we're doing um, is it five times the amount uh, of the key rotation time, so it amounts to about 10 minutes. So it'll get the time to stay all the time. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and, and so, with a lot of the, this timer situation and, and uh, 
and try to come up with the right magic numbers for it. This is all things that can nicely be researched in labs in various environments. I, I was recently uh, traveling and uh, airplanes now have um, internet while you go over the sea. So that was a lot of fun, trying to wire guard with the latencies from satellite airplane internet going super fast to the skies. Um, the, the goal is actually to make it so that you don't tweak these numbers, to find numbers that really work in, in all circumstances. Um, we'll, we'll see what the network people say and what the academics say. Maybe there are different models that people will want to use in different cases, but I think for now a good goal for simplicity is to find the numbers that do work. And So far, the, I think what we have for now is working quite well, but we'll, we'll see. Okay, questions? All right. Yep. So in terms of scheme, what do you think you have a trade-off? First, uh, when you said it's so tough, you have a latency. What's the latency factor? Yep. So yep, for the first packet. And uh, you said that this is a complaint. How do you work in the Um. Yeah, it works fine. It's it's just the it's whatever the ping time is. Uh, so if I'm you know pinging Google or something with servers everywhere from a plane uh, directly, or I'm sending the first packet through WireGuard, the 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 round trip time is more or less the same. Uh, the time spent in the kernel to do the cryptography uh, for the key exchange is is negligible. Uh, it, We'll, we'll see in a bit, the, the primitives are quite fast. So it's really just whatever your network conditions are. Um, okay, so the crypto. Uh, the key exchange is, is based on a new protocol called Noise uh, um, from Trevor Perrin, the same guy who did TechSecure and the Exodal Ratchet. Um, I guess he's, he's been doing IETF stuff for a while. Um, and it's... Uh, it's based on forming the, the uh, what's called a trippy diff, Diffie Hellman, a triple Diffie Hellman. Uh, so we have our static keys and our ephemeral keys, and uh, we make shared secrets based on a combination of three Diffie Hellman operations. Um, so after, if we have time, we can go into exact details on how the protocol works with that. Um, but that's that's the core of it. Uh, we do some tricky things to work around uh, patents that Microsoft has from a um, paper they put out called KEA Plus, and uh, we specifically avoid their patent things. And actually, in the practice of having to do that, um, we come up with some additional nice properties. Uh, so it turns out to be a blessing in disguise. Um, we don't have uh, what's called cipher agility. Uh, I mandate these are the ciphers we're using. These are secure and working. And if they're ever broken, well, you have to replace the software anyway when they're broken uh, with, you know, what, whatever's a good replacement for it. Um, in which case they'll just change. So now I think these are good and strong ones. And I, I don't expect them to change for a uh, very long time. Um, but if they do, uh, then you just have a, a new incompatible protocol. I don't want downgrade attacks like TLS. I don't want any sorts of agility. Okay, I guess we're, we're running out of time, so we'll hurry up here. Uh, so cha cha 20 with poly 1 through 5 does the symmetric encryption. Um, something from uh, Dan Jate Bernstein as well as Curve 25519 for Diffie Hellman. Blake 2B is based on cha cha, sip hash. Uh, is another DJB thing. Um, right now we're not using the kernel's crypto stack. Uh, I don't like the API, it's big and cumbersome. Uh, it does have some nice offloading and async things. Um, but right now it doesn't seem like a good fit for something that's small and minimal. Um, if, some, if a contributor comes along and says, actually here is a really nice way we can integrate with it, then I'm totally for that. But uh, right now, it seems only only disadvantages to do that. Um, we also have the fundamental property with this, which is there are no allocations made ever in response to remote packets. Um, and no kernel state ever changes unless a packet is authenticated. Um, uh, so that way we can put this key exchange stuff in the kernel without having to worry about the typical security 
denial of service issues you have with key exchanges. Um, so two crypto questions we can, we can get to after if we have time. Um, how do we actually do this replay attack protection with only a two message key exchange? Uh, some tricky things. And how do we deal with, uh, with, out, with out of order messages since this is UDP based um, while, while still being secure? Um, and in fact, both of these are achieved and we can talk about this later if we have time. Um, the performance is great so far. I, uh, it's very unscientific uh, testing, but so far uh, compared to OpenVPN, the, the numbers are pretty clear. Um, basically, I can do line rate gigabit um, without any problem on, on most hardware I have. Whereas OpenVPN, since it's user space and I don't know, a big rat's nest of code, maxes out pretty fast, uh, not to mention some latency issues. Um, so I've got AVX and AVX2 implementations on x86. Um, at some point, I'll, I'll write some ARM implementations uh, to accelerate it on there. Um, right now, the C implementation is plenty fast, too, though. Um, I need to support the kernel scatter gather API for zero copy. Um, uh, which, which uh, if anyone wants to get involved, would be quite a nice contribution. Uh, send and receive offload is, is some more things like that. Um, and, uh, and optimize the crypto key routing table. Um, okay, so wireguard.io has what we're currently putting out there. And uh, I need developers. <laughs> um, Okay, any, any questions or, uh, yeah? What are the top of these like software? Any what? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And actually you can put uh, V4 in V6 and V6 in V4 because it's just transparent layer three. Um, and uh, in, in my testing rig, this is all tested regularly. And, yeah. What about the requirement to start to start. Oh, um, uh, we need it's four four point one and up is what I'm supporting. Um, some some fella at Google has recently added some really nice APIs to the networking system that really accelerate uh, UDP encapsulation, and so I'm making use of that. So it's rather recent. Um, for a while, I was backporting things to run on old old ones, but now that it looks like the latest distro releases are going to be 4.1 and up anyway, yeah, I'm keeping it there. Uh, so right now, none of this is upstream. So I, this, I'm at the very beginning of this. I've been working on it for quite a while, and it's super stable and has received a lot of testing. Um, but um, I'm still waiting on Academia to to validate the the cryptography. I don't want to release a bunch of code to the public that is going to, you know, I, that's something that really needs to be done correct. Um, uh, but it, it builds as a module where you can jerry rig it in directly to your menu config. Yeah. What's the communication state? Uh, not right now, but you can join the mailing list. And uh, in a couple of days, I'll look at everyone who's joined from the conf and send out some credentials. And uh, then you can get the pre-release of the code. Again, I, I, I'm not going to be pushing this to the public until I'm positive the crypto is safe. But uh, you put your email in, and in a couple of days, I'll send that out. Yep, so, so every time you have any private key material in this uh, that's allocated uh, on the stack, I'm zeroing it out with the mem0 explicit function. Uh, and I've tried to make pretty religious use of that. Um, hopefully I haven't missed any and all of auditors looking at that. Um, uh, 
ultimately the private key is somewhere, um, but uh, he 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 allocated. Um, Ah, that's clever, yeah. If something leaks, you use your backup. Even if you just get sure, obviously. That's a great idea. Yeah, thanks. Okay. Yep. <laughs> right. What I want to say is that I found that all the Okay, and. So in the OpenVPN config I use for it, um, it's using uh, AES GCM uh, with AES NI from OpenSSL's implementation. Maybe that's a terrible implementation, but it is using that. The bottleneck uh, there isn't so much uh, AES NI, um, but just this is user space. So every packet that's sent has to be bubbled back and forth and you have buffer issues and I mean, Tuntap is, is great for playing with things and making prototypes really fast, but for any high-performance networking, uh, it, it just doesn't scale. Um, the unfortunate thing is right now, basically your only option is you get some dedicated hardware device or you use IPsec. No one really knows how to use IPsec. It's too complex, so uh, th this is my solution to it. So some people can use it, okay. <laughs> Yeah, so, so it, it is it is possible to set up IPsec correctly, and no, no, it, it, it is possible. P people do it. I mean, I'm sure you you've studied it enough, and you can do it. I've seen over and over way too many broken implementations of it. Um, so okay, so it's it's hard to do correctly, but not impossible. So fine. Um, the, the the other thing is that the attack surface of IPsec. Is huge. If, if you if you ever looked at at any of the swans or raccoon, any of the the Ike uh, daemons, it's 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 a massive attack surface and very complicated. Uh, I, I, on top of that, I'm not I'm not sure if um, if uh, if Ike is really the way to go cryptographically. Oh, okay. Um, all right. Let's we can talk after about this, but thanks. Thank you.